Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the Project Pro Industry podcast, where we speak with data science and machine learning leaders uh, on enterprise use cases uh, of uh, data science and uh, AI. Uh, today, we have with us uh, Gagandeep. Uh, Gagandeep is a, a senior data science manager at Zikr, where he focuses on NLP and speech analytics, uh, and also more recently, uh, Gen AI projects. Uh, Gagandeep has almost uh, five years experience, most of it focused on uh, NLP, and today's conversation is going to be focused on uh, uh, data labeling. Uh, welcome, Gagandeep, to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Sure. Uh, so, uh, Gagandeep, to begin with, uh, it'll be um, helpful to understand uh, when you start working on an a NLP project, right? Uh, what are some of the questions you ask before you start to ensure feasibility and that the outcomes that promised actually show up? Uh, okay. So I think uh, some of the questions that I uh, usually ask when I start working on any project is uh, like, what are we trying to solve and what is the objective of this project? So I think it's somewhat clear usually. But yeah. uh, let's say we have been assigned to create a sentiment analysis model. Mm -hmm. So uh, your question should be, are we going to add this sentiment analysis model to a chatbot? Or is it going to be an industry specific model? Or is it, is it going to be a generic model? Because uh, when you look at it from a chatbot pers perspective, then uh, you would see that you would ask certain questions. Let's say you asked, uh, what did you like? And the user responded with, let's say, food. So if you just input the word food into your sentiment model, then you would get a neutral sentiment as output. Uh, so you would also have to embed the question into model. So uh, getting the requirements uh, before working on it is definitely a good idea. Then uh, you could also ask like, uh, how do you handle emojis? Because the industry which we work in, people usually respond with emojis sometimes. They would just give thumbs up and they would, uh, just write hard symbol mm -hmm. and uh, so that could create a problem because uh, if you are not processing that things correctly then you would get the wrong output mm -hmm. so these are the uh, two things that you should ask uh, second is uh, let's say you are working on an entity recognition model mm -hmm. and uh, so you could ask questions like how do you handle the titles mr mrs how do you handle this because uh, when I started working, so I faced this kind of issue where, you know, I, uh, for some examples, I had labeled Mr. and uh, Mrs. and Doctor and uh, some other titles. And in mm -hmm. some examples, I haven't. So uh, when the results start came, uh, so the, when the results start coming in, uh, I noticed that Mr. was being considered as a different entity. Like it was considered as a separate entity because how the data was labeled. So I think understanding all of things beforehand and working on uh, the project is definitely a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and there could be, again, uh, when you're working, these questions change from project to project. So if you're working on a different project, you uh, there would be a different set of questions. But it is usually around the data, like how would you handle the edge cases and all of sort, all sort of these things. Mm -hmm. Understood. And, you know, just like you rightly said at the end of this, which is it's all about the data and especially in NLP kind of tasks, um, um, more the amount of training data, uh, ideally, the better the model gets. Uh, so the question is, how do you decide on the trade off between the volume of high quality label data versus the time and the budgets out there to get an output? Um, yeah, what are some filters you use to make those trade offs? Uh, okay, so that entirely depends on the timeline you have been given. So, for example, uh, you want to run a quick POC for a client. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in that scenario, there are two cases. One is the client has already given you some data and you have to kind of uh, run, run some analysis on top of that. Let's say uh, extracting insights out of that data. Another scenario would be uh, you don't have any kind of data then it gets tricky because then uh, you have to strictly follow the timelines. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have been given one week. So ideally you could spend uh, three, four days on uh, working on the data itself. And during that time, uh, there are a couple of options that you could follow. So first is 
like currently we're in the era of gpt so you could use gpt to generate uh, training data mm -hmm. but sometimes uh you know that doesn't work out so uh what you can do is you can manually label the data so this is what i personally like to do mm -hmm. uh what i like to do is i train the data manually sorry label the data manually let's say uh 50 60 examples mm -hmm. Then uh, once I have all of these examples, I uh, usually use a couple of techniques. One is, uh, so earlier I used to use uh, set fit, which is a few short classification technique. So I have few examples. Now I can uh, build a classifier on top of that, that could give me good results. So that was one technique which I used to follow. Mm -hmm. uh, right now I'm using GPT again uh, with a similar kind of approach. I uh, give it examples that this is my example and this is the output for that. Please generate more instances of this, like mm -hmm. synthetic data. Mm -hmm. uh, apart from this, I also used Argila. So Argila is a data labeling tool. So uh, mm -hmm. it requires some kind of uh, learning curve, but mm -hmm. it's like super good. So what you can do is you just label some small amount of data, you input mm -hmm. that data, and then you add some, uh, let's say, unlabeled data and you could run similar similarity match on top of that so you just have one example and it could give you 10 more examples that are similar to it so that just kind of speeds up the data labeling process mm -hmm. and uh, you can also generate like the data quality is also very superior uh, mm -hmm. compared to if you just do a different approach mm -hmm. so and uh, so this is the kind of approaches i follow uh, again when you move from project to project, uh, these things change, uh, tools can change. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, Argila is usually good, but uh, for uh, different kind of data, it usually mm -hmm. doesn't work. So you will have to also look for different tools uh, that are available and that can fulfill your uh, needs. Understood, got it. So, um, you know, uh, so you're basically saying the traditional tools like Argila, and more recently, uh, ChatGPT is a new entrant into helping you with uh, generating uh, sample data, yes. right? Um, now, in the whole world of data la labeling, we hear of an annotators. Yes. Could you maybe help us understand what are annotators uh, mm -hmm. and how do you maintain uh, consistency and quality across multiple annotators? Right. So, uh, so let's say, uh, let's consider a scenario where you have to, let's say, label the data for... Mm -hmm. uh, let's say for a specific use case. Mm. So uh, I popular, I usually rely on two tools. One is Label Studio mm. uh, and another one is Archila. So mm. they have user uh, management options where you could allow different annotators to label the same uh, set of data. And let's say they each labeled 100 uh, responses each and uh, at the end, you could export them and you could implement a voting mechanism on top of that to mm -hmm. see which were uh, which label was labeled uh, highly and uh, mm -hmm. let's say uh, there's also a thing that you can add here which is uh, let's say there is a person who doesn't annotate uh, very well mm -hmm. so you could implement the weighting mechanism in the uh, voting algorithm mm -hmm. to reduce the weights or you could you know uh, add different guidelines in the tool and also train him. So there are various things that can be done, but mm -hmm. usually these are the two tools that I rely to maintain the consistency. Got it. Now, early in the conversation, right, when you were talking about specific data sets for labeling, right, you mm -hmm. were talking about having, you know, 50 records or 75 records and, and things like that. Uh, uh, but we also hear, whenever we hear about NLP projects, we hear of thousands, millions of, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, records used for training. So yes. are these different scenarios um, or are we referring to two different things? It'll be helpful to understand the difference. Okay. So uh, like for running quick POCs, uh, mm -hmm. you can use a smaller data set. But mm -hmm. when you are moving to uh, a real world project or you are delivering the project to a client or let's say uh, in Zikr itself, mm -hmm. we uh, Cater different industries. For example, mm -hmm. automobile, healthcare, insurance. It's mm -hmm. it all comes in BFSI, mm -hmm. but uh, we have healthcare, uh, BFSI, mm -hmm. automobile, uh, retail, mm -hmm. and uh, I believe there are a couple of B two B clients as well. Mm -hmm. So in that scenario, uh, 50, 60 examples won't work. So mm -hmm. what we usually do is we uh, scrap the data uh, mm -hmm. which is available, 
uh, and these data this data belongs to that specific industry which contains all the technical jargons of that industry mm -hmm. for example if we talk about airline then there's a concept of turbulence if we mm -hmm. don't add that data then the model won't be able to understand if that is a good thing or a bad thing mm -hmm. similarly for uh, let's say boats uh, mm -hmm. upstream downstream all mm. of these things that had to be added. So when you are moving towards, you know, uh, bigger projects and you have to add more and more data that mm -hmm. also, uh, you know, looks into the industry uh, jargons. So huh, for smaller POCs, you can rely on small data sets. But when you are uh, building big projects and, uh, of course, uh, having large amount of data, maybe in millions, is yeah. definitely a good option. Okay. And, you know, uh, um, going back to the example that you mentioned, the airline industry, the word is turbulence. And obviously, right. a model that has not seen that word before does not know is that good or bad. Right. Uh, now, from your experience, right, is there a rule of thumb mm -hmm. where how many occurrences of turbulence are roughly needed for a model to get a good sense of is turbulence good or bad? Okay. Is there a That's definite a, way to think about that? That's a very good question. I think, uh, so what I like to do is, Mm -hmm. So, uh, there could be, uh, you know, what you can do is, mm -hmm. or what I had done was I used to uh, kind of generate synthetic data, more of mm -hmm. like, so for example, if we generally talk about the word uh, turbulence, mm -hmm. so let's say you are talking about the airline industry, so we could, mm -hmm. what we could do is we could use uh, keyword extraction mm -hmm. to generate all of the important words. Mm -hmm. On top of that, uh, there are also words that, uh, you know, are usually provided by the clients. For mm -hmm. example, if you are talking about the banking, uh, then uh, there could be words like uh, RTS or, you know, the mm -hmm. transfer mechanisms like banking. Yeah. Let's say uh, the data which is available online doesn't include all of these things. Mm -hmm. So in that scenario, it becomes a challenge. So uh, mm -hmm. it can be uh, resolved before the model deployment or it can be done after the model deployment mm -hmm. both options are available mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so uh, this also brings down to me like uh, what can be done to kind of uh, like check for these issues mm -hmm. so uh, there was a blog from amazon uh, in mm -hmm. 2022 mm -hmm. which talked about model drift uh, mm -hmm. NLP model drift, right? Mm -hmm. So for numerical data, it's quite easy. You mm -hmm. uh, just check for the distribution, mean, medium, mode, and all sort of things. But mm -hmm. for numerical data, sorry, for uh, NLP data, textual data, it's mm -hmm. kind of very difficult. Mm -hmm. So what they had done was they implemented, uh, I would say, vector search kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So for example, they had 1 million training examples and they mm -hmm. used sentence transformers on top of that and mm -hmm. added all of this data to a vector database. Then mm. on the uh, occurrence of a new, so let's say new feedback comes in or new response comes in, mm. you kind of do some similarity search. And if you find that the example doesn't match, you kind mm. of flag it. Mm. And then again, the process, this this is kind of an active learning technique. Mm. Uh, where you just add that data again to the training data. So this was mm. something that they had implemented. They had written a blog on top of that. So I also use uh, similar kind of thing to uh, measure the accuracy. And I think it can be implemented for uh, different industries as well to uh, do such thing. Got it. Uh, so since you brought up active learning, right? Could you maybe help us understand what role does active learning play uh, mm -hmm. in data la labeling for an LP, and how does it bring down the burden of uh, uh, mm -hmm. manual data lab labeling? Okay. So active learning is uh, again the process of you know continuously improving the model. Mm -hmm. So there are a couple of ways in which uh, you know. So first of all, let's talk about how does it remove the burden. Mm. So uh, let's say we talk about a very uh, basic case. So in our platform, what we had done was we uh, for we added a new client and mm. it was from one industry uh, which was not tuned uh, mm. in our model. And we were getting a lot of you know uh, complaints and feedbacks from the client that uh, mm. you know this isn't working. Mm -hmm. So we added a flag button there and uh, the client would, you know, flag that response that this is not coming correct. Mm -hmm. And it would again, uh, there was a complete data pipeline that we had built. Uh, it was connected to Label Studio mm -hmm. where that feedback would be received in the Label Studio and one person could, you know, assess that and mm -hmm. do the modifications or whatever, uh, you know, the client says that this, uh, what this label should be. 
Mm-hmm. And again, the model would be trained, and uh, a rerun kind of a migration would happen that would uh, update the responses. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so again, if we had just gone through the, uh, so there could be two ways. One was this way. Another could be you scrap the data for that industry, and you again label it, and you add that all of that data to your models, uh, mm-hmm. that knowledge transfer. Mm-hmm. So uh, again, these kind of things they continuously happen. But let's say instead of this human loop, if we add mm-hmm. a GPT, mm-hmm. then uh, GPT they are I think they are more reliable uh, in terms mm-hmm. of not as reliable as humans, but I think mm-hmm. they are getting close. Mm-hmm. So if anything is flagged, then they could it could be passed to GPT, and GPT will can take actions based on the prompts, based on the industry, based on the client needs, and again yeah. the training would happen. Yeah. So. I think this is definitely uh, even if we talk about the software engineering life cycle, it's yeah. very different from ML life cycle. ML mm-hmm. models, even after deployments, they need to be continuously updated with uh, yeah. new trends. Okay, got it. Makes sense. And uh, just trying to understand this is one more example, Gandhi, which is uh, you were talking about having 50 rows of training data versus a million, right? You're talking about POCs and de- deployment. So now okay. let's say we take a sample. A uh, use case like let's say a resume parcel, for example. Okay. Um, if you trained that resume parcel with let's say two hundred mm-hmm. um, uh, sample uh, resumes versus okay. two hundred thousand, uh, okay. could you help us understand what will be the difference in output at two hundred and two hundred thousand? What will uh, what will it recognize? What will it not recognize? Uh, just to understand, roughly. Okay. I know. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so I think uh, one difference between both of these will be uh, the data quality. Mm. So uh, it could be possible that uh, the one which has million examples, mm. it would have a lot of examples which were maybe misclassified versus the 200 which are highly, uh, you know, highly labeled data, high mm-hmm. quality data. Mm-hmm. So that is definitely one difference. Mm. Uh, another thing could be the one uh, which has million examples, it could cover all of the different cases. Uh, let's say, uh, if we talk about the resume, then it could cover all of the different styles. Mm. For example, if we talk about the ATS, um, mm. so ATS, uh, it only covers a uh, few of the resumes, like there's this particular style that needs to be followed mm. versus let's say the million one can cover a lot of different cases. Mm. Right? So that is the difference. Uh, that I can see uh, will happen. Okay. So you're saying if that 200 training data set was of very high quality right. for a specific kind of job profile, it will yes. still work very well. Yes, yes. Uh, it will understood. Be. Okay. Got it. Okay. So um, now in scenarios um, where there is a data imbalance kind of issue, mm-hmm. how do you address that? Um, and you know h- how important do you think data annotation plays a role in that? Okay, uh, so for that, I think, uh, so there was a technique which I used, uh, which was adversarial attacks mm. uh, to kind of, you know, generate more data plus uh, mm-hmm. do testing plus uh, do how the mod- so kind of check how the model is performing. Mm-hmm. So this was one technique. Uh, apart from that, let's talk about uh, how would I handle uh, imbalanced data. Mm-hmm. So it, if we talk about the current scenario, then I think the best option is again, uh, GPT. So mm-hmm. you kind of generate prompts and you input that data. It would give you many more examples. But let's mm-hmm. just not talk about GPT. Mm-hmm. So uh, if you have to do it today, mm-hmm. I think uh, one of the techniques could be mm-hmm. sentence similarity. Mm-hmm. So let's say I have a thousand examples of mm-hmm. uh, which is distributed among four class, uh, mm-hmm. and class has let's say just fifty examples. Mm-hmm. So I could do what i could do is i could collect a lot of unlabeled data from mm. internet mm. i could apply a uh, similarity search so mm. this is what i used to do i would apply similarity search to gather more responses like that mm. uh, and on top of that i would apply filters like the sentiment and tone mm. so again this depends on uh, use case to use case but usually mm. the similar uh, sentiment sentences they could be grouped together mm. topic modeling is also one technique but i usually don't rely on it much uh, because I think sentence similarities, I feel it's much superior. Mm-hmm. And uh, so again, uh, you have 50 responses, you collected more responses using this sentence similarity, and then you could quickly, uh, you know, label this data mm-hmm. and 
maybe la la label this data or you can just uh, run predictions on top of it and correct the result uh, which were not correct. So mm -hmm. this is what I used to do. Understood, got it. And um, so, you know, so you've gone through this, you've trained the model, the model gives out an output. And like you rightly mentioned in a numerical data scenario, you you, you do some kind of a distribution to figure out uh, how accurate the output is. But in the NLP scenario, how do you determine a benchmark and how well is the model's output performing? How do you think about that? Okay, so uh, there are a couple of ways. So in 2020, there was a paper released, which was uh, behavior analysis. Mm. So at that time, uh, many models were being released, uh, which mm. were based on the transformers architecture, like mm. BERT and Roberta. Mm. So there was a, a group of people, I think they had, they were, I think, college students, they had written mm. a paper, behavioral analysis. So mm. what they did was they did sort of comparisons across different models by swapping mm. some kind of words. Mm. And what they noticed, what, what they noticed was that uh, if you replace entities, let's say, for mm. example, if you just change doctor to engineer, then you would get an entirely different output, which shouldn't happen, right? Mm. And this is also some kind of bias, you would say, or I think you could say it anything, but uh, mm. this is the kind of analysis what they did. Mm. So going forward, I think there are uh, there's a library uh, which is known by the name of text attack. Mm. Uh, they, what they have is they have different recipes uh, mm. and this uh, behavioral analysis this is one of their recipes where mm. uh, they had created templates you just uh, input the sentence and it mm. will give you uh, different uh, sentences by swapping out the words mm -hmm. uh, so this is something that i do on a quarterly basis to you know when i have or maybe when i have added new industry mm -hmm. uh, this kind of gives me idea how my model is performing Mm -hmm. And uh, let's, uh, if we talk about 2024 or 2023, mm -hmm. I think GPT is a good way to generate mm -hmm. more amount of data, synthetic data, uh, mm -hmm. which is little different, but usually covers uh, the industry which you are talking about. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could use that to uh, kind of assess the model. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, like I said, uh, the Amazon's approach of uh, assessing the model. So mm. that is also something that uh, could be added to kind of uh, do the checks for you. Okay. So in terms of emerging trends or technologies when it comes to data labeling, um, mm. you think GPT, um, the Amazon way of doing it, uh, those two things, are there anything else you can think of? Yeah. Uh, so interestingly, uh, I have been working on agents. Uh, mm. like. So agents are like, uh, if I talk about it, they are like, uh, let's say, uh, a person or a task which is assigned a task, uh, yeah. or a process which is assigned a task. Yeah. So I was working with Crew AI, uh, and uh, I it occurred to me that if I create 10, 15 different agents, mm. whose only task is to uh, label a data. Mm. So instead of you know real persons, I could mm. add add these as annotators and mm. this would help me speed up the data labeling process and mm. uh, would generate thousands of data for me uh, mm. and i could attach different llms to these agents mm. and that would help me get different responses for each feedback and then i could implement a voting mechanism on top of that mm. i think this is a very interesting uh, thing that i've been uh, learning to do very and i think yeah i think even in future you will see i think a uh, lot of companies are uh, you know building up around these gpt platforms that help mm. you label the data yeah uh, so i think this is the uh, emerging trend that could happen uh, mm -hmm. the data with gpts okay and just one follow up question on that is these agents that you have uh, the way the way you have given them work are they all roughly doing similar overlapping things or have you split up the work for different agents doing different things Mm -hmm. or uh no so they are all performing similar tasks mm. uh so huh interesting thing on that is we could pass uh the output of one model to another model or maybe mm. the reasoning of one output to another agent mm. so that would that way uh, the another agent could understand what uh like what is the reasoning behind this output mm. Mm. and that would help him make uh, better predictions Mm -hmm. So this is again, uh, it's all experimental and uh, research uh, area for now. Understood. Okay. Now, in a world where the uh, uh, you know the, the underlying GPT three, four, four kind mm -hmm. of models 
uh, are taking over a lot of the NLP kind of tasks. Where do you think the traditional machine learning NLP models come in? Uh, where would you pick one versus the other? How should people think about that? Okay, uh, so you're talking about traditional models versus the GPT, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I think, uh, so feature engineering is definitely one area which I mm. think uh, GPT hasn't reached to that level. Mm. Uh, for example, if I talk about one use case, uh, mm. so this was during uh, my college days when I was learning about ML. So there was a project mm. which mm. talked about, uh, you know, retail store uh, sale prediction. Yeah. So they had this data, right? And mm. they were getting about 67% accuracy. Mm. So what they did was as a part of feature engineering, they added weather data to it, mm. right? So a GPT model cannot do this kind of things. I believe mm. it cannot do it now, maybe in future. Mm. Mm. And that led to increase in accuracy by 15%, right? So even I, I think if you have some kind of data, Mm. If you perform right amount of feature engineering and uh, do all the things, then I think mm -hmm. traditional models would work uh, as good as a GPT. Mm -hmm. A GPT could find more patterns, but it won't be able to perform the uh, human level feature engineering for now. I think. Got it. Okay. Um, thank you. Thanks, Karandeep. This has uh, been very, very helpful uh, doing a deep dive on um, uh, data labeling. Thanks for your time. Thank you.